Hello, and welcome to Everything Fear, with me, Kit Tinsley. This show is dedicated to all things horror, so please, sit down, get comfortable, and stay scared. Welcome to episode two of Everything Fear. Coming up this week, we have an interview with the actor David Howard Thornton, who played Art the Clown in the film Terrifier and will soon be seen in Terrifier 2. We have a short story from author Joe Berto, read by my friend Chris Clark. We have some listener submitted true horror stories. We have spooky news. And we have a review of the movie Doctor Sleep. If you enjoy the show, then please subscribe and tell all of your friends. Share this with as many of your friends as you can. Thank you. And now it's time for spooky news. I'll look at all things weird and wonderful happening around the world. This week, we're looking at a haunted house in Louisiana that is up for sale. Well, it's up for grabs for free. You do not have to pay for this house, but no one is taking it because it is so haunted. It's a lovely big house and um, it was built in the 1930s, but former residents have claimed that the home is haunted. A woman called Dawn Vallet de Clout claimed that the house was haunted by the ghost of her great-grandmother, Adele. Adele had lived to be about 90 in the house. And is this, this is my favourite part of this story. This ghost is known for meddling in the kitchen, doing things like cooking. The ghost is actually cooking. Apparently, if you go in the kitchen and set things up ready to make a meal, you go out the room, all of a sudden it's on the stove cooking. Why is no one taking this house? I want a house that comes with a ghostly housekeeper I don't have to pay. This uh, next story, and I think this is quite a problem, actually, quite a few people. This is about one specific group, but I've read things about others doing it. Is that ghost hunting groups are basically being caught meeting up and going out even though we're in the coronavirus lockdown. Um, This story refers to a group who are going around the woods in Yorkshire, and even their own fans are saying, why are you meeting up and doing ghost hunts together? Are you really this thick? You don't work together, so why are the three of you at the same location? All right. You know, this lockdown, it's hard on everyone. There are things that all of us want to be able to do that we can't at the moment. But do you think that going ghost hunting is an essential activity to go out of the house for? I mean, I suppose you could argue they're only putting themselves at risk because they're going to places where there's not likely to be other people, not other people who can catch the coronavirus anyway. Um, But yeah... um, these people got caught because they're posting Facebook lives of their investigations. If you insist on doing it, don't tell everyone about it.
And now it's time for the first part of this week's interview with actor David Howard Thornton, who you probably best know as Art the Clown. And now we're joined by the actor David Howard Thornton, who most of you will know best for playing Art the Clown in the film Terrifier. Hello, David. Hey, how are you doing, man? I'm not too bad, thank you. And you? Doing pretty good, as, you know, as well as I can manage right now. <laughs> yeah, we're all in the same boat. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. <laughs> the plague boat. Thank you very much for coming on to do the interview. Oh, you're welcome. The first thing I wanted to ask was, how did you get into acting? Wow. I, I basically came out of the womb as an actor. Uh, my, my parents were heavily involved with like our church theater growing up. And so my mom would direct shows and my dad would act in them. And so I was kind of just pushed right into that. And I loved it from the get go. But it wasn't really until I got into uh, middle school and my mom thought it would be a good way to get me on my shell to get me involved in like community theater. Yeah. And so... That, that's what really started the love right there when I, I could make people instead of, you know, being bullied and being made fun of. I had people laughing with me instead of at me. So that, yeah. was, that was a great power trip in a way. <laughs> it's like turning the tables on everybody. So I was like, yeah, I like this. I, I want to continue this path. So how did you get the part of Art the Clown? I just lucked upon it. It was a, a posting that they had online, and um, at the time, I had taken off a few months just to audition, and so I, I had been going through a whole round of auditions where I was up for like three or four different Broadway tours, and all of them fell through at the last second. There, I was in like final callbacks for all kinds of things, and I was just like, oh, come on. <laughs> and then this audition came up, and they were looking for a tall, skinny guy to uh, play art that had like um, some, some, they want some of that had like experience with like physical comedy yeah. or clowning, which I have both. Oh wow! And so I was like, Oh, this is perfect for me. And it turned out if I had gotten in any of those tours that I had auditioned for, I would either not have been able to audition for art or I wouldn't have been able to film the film. Yeah. So it worked out perfectly for me. Yes, so definitely. I just went in and I, I, I told my agents, please, please, please submit me for this. So they got me an audition. I went in there and um, they didn't give me a script. And I panicked because I walk into the room <laughs> and everybody else's scripts. And I'm like, oh, no, here I am for my first big film role audition. And I am not prepared. I, I was like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. And so I walk in the room and when they call me and I'm like, I am so sorry, but um, I, I I don't think I'm prepared because I don't have a script. They're like, oh, you, you don't need one. I'm like, really? They're like, yeah, art doesn't talk. Well, I know that, but I figured, you know, I have something to, you know, well, go yeah. off of. <laughs> And they're like, no, no, no. We just want you to um, improvise a scene right now where uh, you decapitate a victim. And I'm like, <laughs> right now, can I have a few minutes? They're like, no, no, no. We want to see how you, how well you think on your feet. I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> that's and, pretty. And, oh, it, it was crazy because that's that's like um, – Improv uh, improvisation is like one of my big things because I, I love to just play around that way and I love to have things thrown at me where I can just like okay just I, I kind of just turn my brain off and just let whatever happen happen yeah and that's what I did and so I just I don't know where this came from but I came up with a scene where I like cartoonishly snuck up behind my victim knocked him out took out a hacksaw and sawed off his head <laughs> picked it up tasted it did not like the taste of it so i took out a salt shaker and seasoned it <laughs> then i tasted again liked it then kind of bathed in the blood for a little bit and then just skipped out on my merry way yeah <laughs> and that's what got me the role i don't know what that somewhere in my psyche that came from and i'm like ah. <laughs> well yeah i mean it sounds a very art thing to do <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I just did not know I had that in me. I was like, oh, boy, that's dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, it got me the role so that they asked me right there on the spot if I would be comfortable, you know, um, wearing lots of makeup and going in for, you know, hours and hours of makeup. And I'm like, yeah, sure. I've done it before doing a lot of children's theater growing up. Yeah. They're like, well, can you come in for a makeup test? 
And I'm like, sure, 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 sure. And that's when I basically know I had the part. I, I think they cast me right there on the spot. Oh, well, that's brilliant. Um, you're talking yeah. about the uh, makeup. How long did the makeup take each day for art? Oh, that usually takes about three to four hours. It depends on like how how detailed we were going that day because yeah. sometimes, you know, we have to do a lot of continuity. And so sometimes, you know, it's like you, you have art at the beginning of the film where he's nice and clean. Yeah. <laughs> Quite <laughs> the opposite by the end. <laughs> oh, yeah. By the end, he's all battle damaged, drenched in blood. He's got his eye gouged out. So, you know, they would have to do extra prosthetics on me and stuff like that. So yeah. that's when it would take a little bit longer because right? they had to like match up all the blood splatters. It's, the continuity is a bitch when it comes to blood splatters. I, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've done a bit of film work myself, but. Uh, never with the sheer amount of blood in terrifier <laughs> oh man it's it's crazy it's because like damon's always having to pull up reference pictures of like the the previous time we had filmed that last scene so he could match up where all the blood splatters were on my face yeah because <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot there are there are and like he does it to himself <laughs> <laughs> i mean it's like I- yay I think that the you film. Want that much blood. Yeah, if you're gonna have that much blood, it's it's gonna happen, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm like you, you're punishing yourself, man. So I, I'm just a canvas here. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, film slash uh, the film Terrifier is a great slasher movie, and it's Thank full you. of inventive moments and kills. But honestly, I think one of the best things in it is your performance. There is something genuinely unnerving about your performance in that film um <laughs> thank you thank you i mean i watched the film when it first came out and i I've, I've just re-watched it this evening actually with my wife who hadn't seen it before and she's quite terrified <laughs> of you now she's hiding upstairs oh <laughs> bless her heart <laughs> but um yeah the, the sort of physicality you bring to the role um the way you can be so still and then move so quickly and just a lot of the you mean you say you had um experience clowning i think that's obvious from the uh little bicycle ride and i find some of those moments more unnerving i think than anything else in the film well thank you thank you i i think they're more fun that because you're not used to seeing horror villains in that kind of you know i guess performance mode you, yeah you, especially like silent ones you're so used to like the, the jasons and mike myers where they're just they just kind of stand there and breathe that's right yeah <laughs> I mean, I think one of my favorite moments is the moment where you, you're you shooting the girl on the floor and the gun runs out and he's oh, <laughs> you know, flapping around. <laughs> well, that, that's what I love about the character. He's very human in that way. He has his emotions. It's not just anger mode all the time. Yeah. Kill, kill mode. He has his moments of frustration. And he has his moments of just glee yeah as well which i, I love about him is it's, it's great he's like even though i don't say anything i'm able to uh thankfully because of the makeup be able to convey those kind of emotions so it's like even though he's not talking you know what he's thinking in his head at the time yes that comes across very very clearly and it's a credit to your performance i mean, thank you the film has a lot of scenes that are quite uncomfortable to watch were they uncomfortable <laughs> to film <laughs> Yeah, but not probably in the way you're thinking because it's <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where you do it over and over and over again, so you know what's going to happen. Yeah. So it's the shock value is already gone there. So it's just like you know, I, I I can distance myself from what I'm actually doing, you know. But it's like in pure in pure comfort levels, yeah, it can be very uncomfortable yeah. because <laughs> it's like we we were filming at very very uh, extreme temperatures. <laughs> oh right <laughs> yes especially for the hacksaw scene that night in that room was very very cold it was about 20 degrees fahrenheit in the room that ooh. night and so that was ooh, 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 ooh. especially yeah. for poor Catherine, the the blonde that plays a dawn yes because yeah she's she's in such a compromising position yeah i mean <laughs> i hate to think how uncomfortable that must have been <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I, I felt so sorry for her because those hours that she was having to do that. Yeah. Hanging upside down, especially we'd only let her hang upside down for like 30 seconds at a time. Then we'd swing her up because it's so dangerous to do that to a yeah. human being. 
And that was that was that was difficult. But she did not complain at all, except for the one time where like some blood went in her eye or went up her nose. And so yeah. I'm like, well, that's that's a reason to complain. Well, I yeah. Ow, 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 as that's well. Sting. So, <laughs> yeah. So she's a trooper. It's like I, I, I I've had my moments on set where I am like a little whiny little bitch at times <laughs> where I'm like, I'm cold. Yeah. Then I'm like and then I see what these girls are doing. I'm like, oh, man, I'm such a pussy compared to them. <laughs> Like I, I'm not hanging upside down naked in 20 degree weather. So. No, although you <laughs> like, did have to do a naked scene. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of miserable too. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for our poor crew, because they were not, they did not sign on for seeing my naked butt all night. So I was like, <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really disturbing sequence as well. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was actually my first night working with Samantha Scafidi as well. So that was I'm like, hi, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Terrifier. What an introduction! <laughs> yeah, it's just I, you know, a lot of people have been like, ah, did I sign up for the shoes? Like, this is freaking awesome. I'm like, okay, we're gonna get along very well. It's one thing that always interests me, you know, when you're making a film like that where everyone's supposed to hate you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How well do you get on with everyone else on set? Um. I, I pretty much, I, I can turn on the art at, at the drop of a dime. So as soon as they start saying, you know, about ready to roll, I, I might take a few seconds just to get into character. But I'm like, as soon as they say cut, I go back to being myself. I'm always cracking jokes and stuff like that. So it's yeah. like, now if like one of my you know, fellow actors needs me to distance myself or something like that, or be serious for a bit so they can get into character, then yeah, I'm totally fine doing that. But I, I'd say for the most part, I'm joking around as much as possible. Oh, that's good. I, I like to keep things upbeat considering what we're doing. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've got to really, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think there's been a lot of times I just start breaking out in song or I start dancing or something like that. It's just... I mean, the few films yeah. I've acted in, um, one was a horror film and two were dramas. And Oh, uh, yeah. And I found the dramas to be much more miserable experiences than the horror films. <laughs> oh, I can't imagine. So I, I hate doing drama anyways. I, I, I'd much rather do horror or comedy any yeah. day. <laughs> it's like, yeah, give me the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, I don't want to be doing all this, like, serious, dramatic stuff. I'm just like, oh, why did you leave me? Blah, blah. I'm like, ah, boring. <laughs> <laughs> uh, were you surprised by the success of the film? And people's reactions yeah. to it. Because <laughs> we, I'm like, I mean, I thought we had something cool, but at the same time, I, I knew what we were, and we were a very, very low budget, you know, horror film, independent film as well. Yeah. So we didn't have studio backing behind us. So we didn't have a studio going out there and doing all the publicity for us. All the, you know, we, we weren't, I mean, we still don't get talked about on like, you know, variety magazine no. or any of those kind of big things, which is crazy. It's like, like IGN never lists us on any of their, um, top horror films or something like that. Cause it's like, we're not a big studio production. I think they're, I think the studios pay these places to, you know, push their films first. They, they never mentioned the independent films. No, of course. So it was, it was the, the independent horror sites and it was the fans themselves that got the word out. So that, that's what surprised me so much. It was like, but that's also like a testament to how important a fan base is. They, yeah. They're the ones that can really make you. I mean, the thing for me with Terrifier is that although you know it's low budget, it doesn't look low budget. Yeah. And that's the, the, the that's a cinematography is brilliant. Thank you. That's a true testament to the, the the talent of our crew that we had. We had a skeleton crew on this thing too. It's like the budget for this was less than a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, <laughs> and and all of the acting in the film is really solid as well, which you know is often what lets down low budget films. Thanks. It's just you know everybody really cared about what we were doing, so it was like a lot of us took a big huge sacrifice on pay and all that because we we knew what we were doing was something cool, but we yeah. just didn't have the budget behind us so we're like well you know what we believe in what we're doing we'll put this out there and let it stand for itself and it's that's just a true testament it's like it you get a bunch of talented people together you can pull off a miracle that's right and i think we really pulled off a miracle with this film it's just <laughs> i'm like it, it, i i've 
when we were, you know, trying to get a budget together for part two, I was, I was exploring how much, you know, most films, even the lowest budget horror films, yeah, what they usually are made for. And they're usually made for at least one or $2 million to $5 million, yeah, even yeah. lowest budget. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> if only. <laughs> if only. I was like, man, we would have been dancing for joy if we got even a million dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's, that would have been so great. <laughs> I mean, you kind of feel that a lot of like Hollywood movies have sort of lost their um, edge because they've got these huge budgets. Yeah. And they, they, don't, they, they don't have to be creative with it anymore. They don't. They, they, they just like, okay, we'll just you know, throw money at CG and stuff like that. It's like yeah. when you don't have much of a budget, you you really have to get creative with what you're doing. And I am like, even for terrifier too, we, our budget is about a half a million dollars and it's, it's a true testament to our crew is just like, I, I've, I, I've seen our wardrobe technician and, um, our, our set designers, they've, they have like, uh, a great example is this, there's this one room for our female lead and the, the, where a lot of scenes are filmed in her room and they, set dress this whole entire room in one night. They stayed up all night and threw this thing together. And it looked amazing. We, you go in there. That was like, for, it was night and day going there from one day to the next is yeah. the amount of detail. I was, I was giddy as a squirrel girl going through this room and looking at the small details that probably no one's going to notice on set. Just like the books in the bookshelves that were, they all had fake covers on them, but they all had like references to different horror films. Yeah. And it was, it was brilliant and like no one's going to see this but they did this themselves and they stayed up all night doing this even if you can't see the de- the you know things like the names of the books on the screen that sort of attention mm-hmm. to detail does come across i think and you know as a film fan i really appreciate the amount of work people put into things like that oh so they're the unsung heroes of this is, is you know, they uh, is, as actors we're the ones to get all the recognition is these these set designers and you know all, all these people behind the scenes that yeah. really really deserve a lot of recognition for what they do because it's it's a freaking miracle what they pull off sometimes. Absolutely. Uh, as you say, uh, you're doing Terrifier two at the moment. Uh, we saw the first shot of art from Terrifier two. I think yesterday was it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing you're not allowed to tell us much about that. <laughs> oh, it's that's it. That 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 one picture though. So it's a great picture. It's it's that scene right there. That room you're looking at is just. That's literally where the shit hits the fan in that room. Ooh. It's just like, oh, this is this is. I I will say that that scene, that look he's giving you is just like it's that whole thing. It's like, yeah, things are about to get real. <laughs> <laughs> It's that that scene. It's uh, it, it starts off a huge. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to get you in trouble for telling us too much. I know <laughs> it's it's just like oh, this is where the film really just kicks into overdrive. So it's yeah. it's, it's exciting. It's oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I we- had so it's it's such oh, I can't wait for you guys to see what happens. Oh, I'm really excited now. Um, when is the film released? Do we know yet? Roughly. We don't know yet. <laughs> we're we're hope, we were originally hoping for a fall release. Yeah, but who knows right now because That's of this it. whole virus. Because we still haven't been able to finish filming. We were almost done when we had to go into lockdown here in New York City. Uh, yeah. I think I had maybe four or five days left on set, and the whole state went on lockdown. So we were ordered to go back. And I was like, oh man, come on, so close. So, <laughs> Yeah, so close yet so far. But the good thing is, is uh, Damien has been making good use of this time. So even though he's been quarantined himself, he's been sitting there editing everything we've already filmed. So like the bulk of the film is being edited right now, you know, with the sound effects and yeah. even the music being plugged in. So he's he's making good use of that time. And he's also basically making all the prosthetics we have to do for these um <clears throat> excuse me, these last scenes that we have to do. So it's, he, he's trying his best to keep us right on track. So hopefully if we can't release this fall, it's, you know, that all comes up, you know, how soon we can get to filming and yeah. how soon we can get distribution behind everything. But, you know, we're, we're trying to get this out as soon as possible because we want everybody to see this. We can't wait for everybody to see this film. Well, I will definitely be first in line. <laughs> 
Yay! <laughs> Do you see yourself playing art again? Oh, of course. I will play this character for as long as people want me to. He's such a fun character. I don't want to give him up anytime soon. That's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. I mean, like, oh, he's, he's a dream role. <laughs> I mean, to me, he's the first slasher villain to come along in a long time who has everything about him to be as iconic as, you know, the sort of the big three. Well, thank you, Ben. I mean, how do you think Art would match up in a fight against either Michael, Freddy, or Jason? Who? That those would be very interesting fights. <laughs> they would, wouldn't they? Yeah, they really would be because, uh, like, as, as you see, you know, Art can take a licking and keep on ticking too. So yeah. it's just like he, he's. I, I always like to say Art is kind of like an, an amalgamation of every single horror slasher villain that's come before him. There's a little bit of everybody. There's a little bit of Chucky. There's a little bit of Freddy and Jason and Mike Myers and and Pinhead and Leatherface. They're all in him. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's like he, basically he's a love letter to slasher villains in himself. Like he's like the ultimate fanboy. He's taken all their best elements and just – that's art. <laughs> yes, yeah, but he's definitely got very much a personality of his own as well, which yeah, I like. Yeah, he's got the charisma that's needed that's been lacking in so many horror villains recently. Yeah, definitely. There haven't he's been. He's fun. Yeah, he's fun. <laughs> but the the film he's is fun. fun, you know, and uh, I think that's what's been missing from a lot of horror recently is yeah the sense they... of enjoyment. Exactly. They, they've gotten too serious with things. Now, I have seen that, though, in more of the independent films where they've had fun with things like the such films like The Babysitter or The Final Girls, stuff yeah, like that. They've yeah. had more fun with the genre. They don't take it as serious. I think mainstream horror like uh, like Hollywood has gotten too serious. Ser- serious. That's a fun <laughs> word. Serious. That's why, <laughs> why art does not talk. <laughs> No, <laughs> English hard, <laughs> but yeah, it's just he becomes like Elmer Fudd all of a sudden. <laughs> Be very, very quiet. I'm hunting victims, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with David Howard Thornton later in the show but now it's time for our horror music section this week's song is called ghosts and it comes to us from my good friend dead boy aka chris clark now chris is a uh, singer songwriter he's in a band called glass onion he's a filmmaker author and um, generally an all-round creative type this song was off his solo album for which he uses the name dead boy And it's quite a haunting song about that feeling when someone's gone. But are they still around you? This is Ghosts. Too many people saw him lying still and cold. Yet I swear I heard him crying. I could he answer me, I saw his name in stone. Well, his skin was slowly dying I don't believe in you How do you haunt me without you? 
true horror stories. This story was sent in by Phil. I used to work night shift on the Syringa ward at Rawsby Psychiatric Hospital, an old Victorian asylum with another nurse. It was really a terminal ward for dementia patients. The dormitory was an old Nightingale style one with beds running down either side. At the other end were two doors. One was a fire door that led outside or to Camilla ward upstairs and the other went to a single bedroom. We sat in chairs at the entrance until it was time to do the rounds, changing beds and turning patients who were unable to turn themselves in bed. One night, about 4am, we both saw a woman wearing a long nightdress walking across the end of the dormitory and into the single room. We got up thinking it was a lady from Camilla Ward and went to return her to her own ward. On entering the single bedroom, there was nobody there apart from a lady who needed turning in bed and couldn't even sit up on her own. This story comes from Mark. In my job as a security guard, I work one of three shifts, 4pm to 12am, 7pm to 3am, or 12am to 7am. I was working the middle shift and driving home at around 3am. The roads I take are generally narrow country lanes, as those are the quickest way home for me. This night, I was about halfway home when I rounded a corner to see a woman, who I would have guessed was in her early twenties, walking down the side of the road. I drove these roads at least two nights a week at this time and had never seen anyone walking down the road. So this was quite a shock itself. This made me carry on a little distance before I realised it was unlikely that a young woman would be walking down the road at this time for no reason. Something must have happened. I stopped and looked into my rearview mirror. I could see her still walking towards me in the moonlight, her head down looking at the ground. I put the car in reverse and slowly pulled back towards her. I realised that this might unnerve her so I kept the car well away from her. As I pulled up alongside her, I stopped the car and pressed the button to bring down the window. As I did, she disappeared. It was literally like she was wiping out of existence with the window going down. Needless to say, I sped home that night, and now I drive home via the main roads, though I often think back to that night and wonder who she was and how she ended up there. This next story is from Julie. When I left school, I got a job working in a shop selling women's clothes on our local high street. This wasn't one of the big chain of clothes stores, but more of a boutique aimed at middle-aged women. The shop itself, like most on the high street, was housed in an old Victorian building. The shop took up the ground and first floor, with a stock room and staff toilet and break room in the basement. One slow Saturday there was just me and the owner working. We had only had one or two people in the shop all day. The owner suggested that I went and made us a coffee. I went down to the break room and began to make the drinks when I heard footsteps in the stock room behind me. I thought I must have not noticed the owner coming downstairs and called out to ask her if she wanted a biscuit with her coffee. There was no reply. I walked over to the door of the stock room and asked again, thinking perhaps she had not heard me. Again, there was no answer. I suddenly realised that the lights in the stock room weren't even on. I nearly jumped out of my skin when my boss appeared behind me asking me where her drink was. At this point, we both heard a giggle in the storeroom. My boss must have seen me turn as white as a sheet as she sat me down and explained that the basement was haunted by a little girl. Lots of staff, including her, had heard her running around down there and laughing over the years, and some had even seen her. I worked there for another few years and periodically heard the little girl. It was something I eventually got used to, but that first time terrified me. And now let's go back to our interview with David Howard Thornton. We, we've gotten back to like the basics with showing the crazy gore. Yeah, 
yeah in the kill scenes. we need this like we've gotten back to the kill scenes where like we have fun with our kill scenes what would be your favorite kill in the first terrifying i, I would you know most people expect me to say the hacksaw scene but i i think my favorite one is the decapitation of the exterminator that is very good it, it's a we had so much fun with that one i'll tell you what my favorite is and it, it's an obscure one but it's the stamping on the guy's head with the clown shoe <laughs> <laughs> something about that that really amused me it's it's a, that's a fun one too it's like in like the prosthetic work that damien did with that was just amazing it, like you only see it for a half second but like i really got up close with that thing yeah. and really looked at it and it's just like man he put like muscles and everything underneath the skin there were layers through that and he also had that with the uh the guy that i killed in the pizza shop with him stabbing in the face it's yeah. like there were you know layers to it it wasn't just a skin and like foam or something underneath there were layers and layers so like when it, it was fun stabbing into that thing because that knife would really stick in there and i'll have to dig it out and all some blood's gushing and i'm like <laughs> oh my god what all did you put into this thing man <laughs> it was awesome yeah it sounds fun i have to say Damien, he's a talented dude. Yes, definitely. He deserves all the recognition and the accolades for what he has done with this. Because, you know, he created the character. He's written the whole, all the scripts. He's directed everything. He's made all the practical effects himself. The man is a, a one-man army. Well, I have a few questions that I ask everyone who comes on for an interview. All right. So we will go on to those. The first question is, what is next for David Howard Thornton after Terrifier 2? Well, I have uh, two movies recently that I, I've basically signed on to. One of them is called Stream. It's um, it's an, what we're hoping is going to be another horror franchise, which is a really cool idea. I wish I could say more about it, but it's um, it's going to be headlined by some of our Terrifier crews. Uh, their uh, own company is called Fuzz on the Limbs Film. Oh. It's actually the exterminator that I killed off in the first one, Mike Levy and his brother, Jason Levy, and their uh, partner, Steve DeSala. The, they, um, they were the two cops, his oh, brother yeah. and Steve. Yeah. And they have their own film company. They have a few films out like Abnormal Attractions, but they're also helping us on uh, Terrifier 2. Like Mike's our AD and Steve and Jason are also helping out on the, the, the crew and everything like that. But they... They've made up their own um, horror franchise, which is pretty cool. They've got already some other horror icons involved in this film as well. So it's going to be a nice team up of different horror icons in some creative ways. So I'm excited about that. We, uh-huh. we hope to start filming that this fall. And then after that, I'm, I'm doing another one where I, uh, I, I don't know if I can release the title yet, but I um, it's uh i i play it's it's a horror western oh that sounds interesting yes and i i play not the villain i'm going to play the hero but oh. he's uh kind of an anti-hero he's he's a, a cowboy that gets killed off and his his skulls basically burned off so it's just his skull so he comes back as he's brought back from the dead by an indian shaman and so he's going out for vengeance. So he's he's like this, you know, like Ghost Rider type cowboy, I oh, guess you could say. So yeah, yeah, that's, it's, that's it's, a lot it's nuts. <laughs> yeah. So and I've always wanted to do a western too. So I'm like, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you ride? So it, it's it's yeah yeah. I actually grew up. It's been a it's been years since I've ridden a horse, but I grew up. I'm from the south anyway, so I grew up riding horses. My yeah. godmother had a farm, and my uh, my uncle had a oh, my great uncle had a farm too. So I grew up riding horses. So this I actually get to get back in the saddle. So oh, that's going to be fun. Literally back in the saddle. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I might have to, you know, take some lessons just to, you know, reorient myself because I, you know, it's been probably about twenty years since I've ridden, but you know, it'll be worth it. Yeah, it'll be definitely. so much fun to do this again. So I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. I will look forward to both of those. Yes. The next question on this show, mm-hmm. we also do uh, true horror stories, and uh, do you have any? true horror stories david has anything spooky ever happened to you (laughs) i have i have count like probably a countless ghost stories i I, i'm a huge believer in the paranormal so i I would say probably my uh, one of my favorite ones though is an apartment i used to live in here in the city 
where a little boy haunted it. Yeah. And I, I called him Randy because he, he was always running around causing mischiefs. He, you would hear him running down the hallways and stuff like that. He would unplug things from time to time. It, and um, you, you occasionally catch glimpses of him. Well, there was this like one night, my roommate and I at the time, we used to have a competition with each other where we would scare each other. We would always hide in the apartment and jump out and scare each other. And yeah. so my roommate has this Noah, he had this fear of zombies, like right. an irrational fear of zombies. He would not even play a Resident Evil game because of zombies. I'm like, dude. <laughs> And, and the funny thing about Noah, too, he's an atheist, so he didn't believe in anything like this. He doesn't believe in any of the paranormal stuff. And so all the stuff would happen in the apartment. I'm like, dude, how is this stuff being unplugged? I don't unplug it. You don't unplug it. You hear these things running around. He's, he's always trying to come up with ex- explanations for it. I'm like, dude, none of us – neither one of us is doing this. <laughs> I don't know what it is. He's like, ah, I don't believe it. So, well, this one night he's going out with his girlfriend and I told him I was going out with my girlfriend at the time. And so I'll say, I'll see you tomorrow. Well, I ended up not going out that night. And I'm like, I, I lied to him. <laughs> and I instead got into my old makeup kit and put on all the zombie makeup. Oh, dear. <laughs> and I didn't know when he was going to get home. So I hid in my bathtub and I like put my Kindle in there, put pillows, brought food so I could be entertained until he got home. Yeah. And so he gets home. I turn out the lights in there. So he comes in the use of the bathroom. And thank God he only went number one. <laughs> <laughs> so he's done that. He's over there washing his hands. And I pull back the shower curtain and just come out. He just, <laughs> just scare the living crap out of the guy. <laughs> I've never heard him scream so much in my life. And then he's like, OK, asshole, you're going to get it. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> I deserve it. I deserve it. So I, I'm in bed that night and something just wakes me up in the middle of the night and I look and standing at the foot of my bed is the kid. Oh, my God. It is like and, and like he looked kind of almost like Pugsley Adams in a way. He had like the striped shirt on, but you yeah. kind of see through him. He's gray and he's just standing there at the foot of my bed glaring at me with his arms crossed. with this <laughs> like look on his face like that's not cool, man. <laughs> Oh. What you did are like, not cool. Do not do this. It's like he didn't say anything. He just kind of just glaring at me. And I'm like, so and I'm like making eye contact with this thing that I can see through. And it's in my room that should not be in my room. And there's like, this is like the first time I've ever like had a full on apparition, just like that kind of experience where yeah. I'm actually seeing something where I could sit there and look at it, not like a, you know, usually it was like a fleeting glimpse of something, but this was like full on eye contact with something that should not be there, which was very unnerving. And I just kind of like, yeah, (laughs) it's like, okay, message received. And I just kind of pulled the blankets over my head and I just sat there and like, just did not move. (laughs) I did not sleep for the rest of the night. And like, And I, I like the next day, I, I, I tell my roommate because he's like looking at me. He's like, what's wrong with you? You look like you've seen a ghost. I'm like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's literally what happened. And I told him everything that happened. He's like, I actually kind of believe you because I have never seen you so shaken up before. But like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're not doing this competition anymore. I don't think Randy's happy with us right now. No, I don't want to piss him off. I don't want to piss something like this off. So truce, man, waving the light white flag and all that. So getting told off by a spirit child, you know, that's, oh, yeah. that's going to stop you doing like, something, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But like, I mean, I, I've had so many of these kind of experiences. Like, you know, it's just like the apartment I currently live in. We have stuff happen from time to time. It's like I, I think it's a woman that ha- hunts our place now. Yeah. It's like I, like I had one night where I woke up and I had this horrible nightmare, and I'm like lying, like it literally shook me to the, my core. One of those kind of nightmares. I, I don't remember what it was about. I just remember it was scary as hell. Yeah. And I, I feel something sit on my bed. And then I feel this cold hand to start stroking my head like a mom tries to comfort a child. Oh. And I was like, okay, I'm freaked out, but oddly comforted at the same yeah. time. <laughs> and it's like, oh, this is sweet, but what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I am not going to look because I don't want to see what is actually touching me right now. <laughs> yeah, probably best not to. 
Yeah, but but thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's a nice gesture. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, you know, it's like, it's one of those things, like, I know this is a ghost, so I should be scared, but at the same time, like, this is a ghost that's actually trying to comfort me. It doesn't mean any harm. So, you know, and that's like the kind of understanding I have with whatever is haunting my part, uh, my apartment right now. I'm just like, you know what? We're inhabiting the same space you do you. Yeah. You're it. not trying to bother me. I'm not going to try to bother you. So you just go on doing your thing. So occasionally a door opens and closes by itself. You know, I feel a cold breeze. I'll catch a, you know, yeah glimpse of a, a dress or something like that i'm like okay cool i was gonna say live and <laughs> let live but that's probably not the right terminology is it? yeah live and let unlive i don't know yeah <laughs> though i will say something did for something freaky did happen last year my my roommate he, he's a bouncer so he's not one of these type of guys that gets unnerved very easily yeah but I, I, I come home from going grocery shopping. I had been out of the apartment for a while, and I, I come home, and he's sitting at the, the, the kitchen table, and he looks at me. He's like, uh, I'm like, yeah, what's wrong, dude? He's like, he's like, but how long have you been gone? I was like, I've been gone for like 30 minutes. We're like, you didn't just walk out? I'm like, no, no, no. I was like, dude, it's like I a little while ago, I was sitting here at the table, and you walked by me and went into the bathroom. You were wearing an orange shirt, and you went went into the bathroom for a while and never came out. Oh, that's weird. And I and I went and check on you, and no one was in the bathroom. But like you closed the door, the door was closed and everything like that. And I'm like, no, I I've been gone this whole entire time. And I, I was wearing a totally different color shirt. I don't even I don't even own an orange shirt. <laughs> But he flat out saw me, like, just walk by him and go into the bathroom. And yeah. I'm like, that is weird. These these things that do that, they look like people you know, and it worries me that. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, wow. It's just like, yeah, I think I saw your doppelganger. I'm like, because I've always heard you don't want to see your own doppelganger. Yeah. I'm like, well, I'm glad you saw him, and I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> But it was just like the, he. I'm like Mike was freaking out over this. He's just like I, I've never seen him freak out like this before because you know we have stuff happen all the time. He's like, oh well, that happened. That's just how we, we are about. It. It's like, oh well, that happens at this one. He's like, I don't know what the hell that was. <laughs> yeah, that's very very strange. Yeah. And it wasn't even something he could see through. It was like it looked exactly like me. The solid per, and he like and it manipulated the environment and everything like that. It yeah. slammed the door. Like didn't lock it, but you know, close the door to the. I'm like, that's weird. That is, that is definitely, <laughs> definitely creepy. <laughs> yeah, I, I love this kind of stuff. It's fun for me. Yeah, me too. It's like it's not. It's it's my thing. It's like as long as it's not trying to hurt me, I, I'm I'm fine with it. The only time I've ever encountered anything like that that put my 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 teeth on edge was when I was on tour and I was up in Providence or Rhode Island at the theater. I like to explore theaters because theaters always have cool stories. Yes, they about do. Them. And I, I'm up there and one of my castmates and I are exploring and we're going up and there's a light booth and there's this room next to the light booth. And I step one foot in the doorway and like everything in my body, like all the alarm systems in my body went off at once. Like, whoa, do not go in this room. Like the, my hair stood on end, just everything. is like, I just like, grip of fear just yeah. came over me. I was like, something is very wrong. And I'm like, I cannot go in this room. And I stepped back and I'm like, that was weird. And, my, and I tell my, my friend, I'm like, go in that room. He's like, okay. And he had that same reaction. He steps in the, he's like, whoa, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. And other castmates came up and everybody were just challenging everybody to go in that room and no one could get past the doorway. Everybody had that same reaction. To yeah. Them. I've, I've been places like and, that. It's not, not pleasant. Yeah, it was, it was not, it was like the strangest. It was like, it just felt evil. Yeah. It, it felt like something like if I go in this room, something bad is going to happen to me. Yeah. And, this and is so I, I, oh, it's, I, I asked the people, you know, at the theater, you know, and I'm like, what? So I've got a question. Uh, this room next to the lighting booth, they're like, oh yeah, don't go in there. <laughs> <laughs> apparently like some kind of murder suicide or something like that happened in there and it's like everybody just everybody steers clear of that room they all have that same reaction to it yeah very very strange it's like oof, that's evil it's like the only time i've ever encountered something that just felt evil yeah 
theatres though you're right theatres always always have uh, interesting stories and creepy oh, they, elements they do and they're, they're usually haunted by something there's always someone that's died or something like that there's always something uh, I used to live in uh, a, a town called Boston mm-hmm. and uh, there we had a uh, theatre that was in a 13th century monastery it had been oh, wow. originally been a 13th century monastery and um, I was doing a few productions there. And one time I was the first, one of the first two people there. And mm-hmm. the, the backstage area, the lights were on. But the lights for the auditorium and the stage were over the other side of the stage. So you had to cross the auditorium and stage in darkness. Oh, wow. To get to the other side. And um, we were halfway across the stage and we heard someone walk around the auditorium. And there was no way anyone could have got in there. So we all went out, got you know torches out, went out into the auditorium. Mm-hmm. And then we heard footsteps across the stage. And then we, the lights came on and it was someone else had come in. But they, they had literally just come in and wondered why we were all screaming when the lights came on. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but apparently there's a monk that comes and sits and watches the plays. So. That's fascinating. That's, that's what I love. It's like, you know, here, you know, our, our, our country is such a baby nation. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, we, we don't have something that's from like the thirteen the thirteenth century. Yeah. It's just like, whoa, that's whew. I, I, I can only imagine the stories a lot of them, you know, a lot out out there. I'm yeah. Like, whoa, boy. There's a lot of places that got a lot of history. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. I can especially a lot of the old castles and yeah. Whoa. Definitely. Exciting. <laughs> it is, it is. It's fascinating to me. But I suppose my final question should be mm-hmm. the final one of my three that I always ask, which is, other than the film Terrifier and Terrifier 2 now, what is your favourite horror movie of all time? Oh, I don't really have a favourite favorite of all time, but I have my top five, okay. which in no particular order would be Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original one, yep. Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, Dream Warriors, The Exorcist, the Omen and the original Halloween. They're all really great movies and they're all different from each other. Yeah. All great choices there. Yeah. Um, they're all fun. They're fun. Dream Warriors is my second favorite. <laughs> of Nightmare, mm-hmm. The Nightmare franchise. The original is still my favorite. It, that's a close second for me. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it never used to be. I don't think, I think Dream Warriors was my favorite when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when I was doing, my degree, my dissertation was on the original Nightmare on Elm Street, so I sort of refell in love with that then and realized oh, how much is in it. It's so good. It's just like I, I think Freddy Krueger is like the best horror villain ever created, though. It's such a creative type yeah, of character. Definitely, it is. It, it's so frightening because it's it's something that can get you outside of the physical realm. It's in your dreams because everybody right. has to sleep. And that's that's just frightening. That's like you can't get away from him. Yeah, turning your own subconscious against you is uh, sort yeah. of very Freudian nightmare. Oh, and it's brilliant because you can do anything you want with that character because it always happens in dreams. That's right. It's like you can do what you can go as creative as you want with the kills and everything. It's just it's fantastic. I love it. Definitely. Well, like Wes Craven, genius. He, he was, <laughs> and sadly missed. Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> well. David, thank you very much for joining us on the show this week. Oh, you're it's very been an absolute welcome. pleasure to talk to you. It's been great talking to you too. This has been fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, and the best of luck with uh, Terrifier 2. Uh, I can't wait for thank it to be released. And the other two projects you discussed. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited. I'm very excited to get all those out to you guys. They're all fun. They're all fun films, all fun scripts. That's what we like. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, stay safe, and I hope you can uh, get out of the house soon. I do too. <laughs> Thank you. I think we you all as do. Well. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But that's the thing: is we're staying inside. We're being smart. <laughs> we are. That is the smart thing to do, people. Yes, yes, yes. Stay inside. The sooner we all stay inside, the sooner we can get by. The the sooner we all stay inside, the sooner we'll all be able to get outside. <laughs> yes exactly it's like stay in so we can go out yeah that's the irony of it <laughs> yeah boy <laughs> thank you very much again david you're very welcome you take good care and have a great night all right thank you goodbye bye
And now it's time for this week's fiction story. This story was written by author Joe Bertion, and it is called The Tooth Fairy. The story was narrated for me by my good friend Chris Clark, who you may have heard earlier with his song Ghosts performing as Dead Boy. So enjoy this creepy tale, The Tooth Fairy. The notion of the Tooth Fairy seems like quite an odd thing to teach little children. The idea that some supernatural entity is interested in paying for our discarded body parts is quite disturbing. Our little friend Grace is about to discover that she has quite the entrepreneurial spirit. It finally fell out, Grace screamed as she burst through the front door. In the palm of her hand she held her front tooth, slick with saliva and blood. Oh, let's wash it up. You can put it under your pillow tonight and the Tooth Fairy will give you some money, her mother said as she guided her over to the sink. Later that evening, Gracie was in her room counting the coins in her piggy bank. She had just over three dollars. She opened the drawer on her desk and pulled out a folded up piece of paper. Becky's Beach Party Playhouse, only $49.99, the ad read. Soon enough, Becky. Once I get paid for my tooth... We're going to buy you that playhouse, Grace said to her Becky doll. Grace, it's time for bed, her mother called from downstairs. Grace hurried over to her bed and waited to be tucked in. Her mother opened the door and smiled. She bent down and picked up the ad. Do you have your tooth? she asked Grace. Grace nodded and held out her hand. Let's tuck it under your pillow so the tooth fairy can find it. Maybe you can save up enough to buy Becky's playhouse, her mother said as she lifted the pillow and placed the tooth underneath. Good night, Mommy, Gracie said. Good night, sweetheart. Gracie woke up in the morning and eagerly checked under her pillow. She found a dollar. She frantically tore the sheets off the bed in search of more money but found none. A lousy bug, she asked bitterly. She took the dollar and added it to her piggy bank. If that's all the Tooth Fairy is going to pay, I'm going to need a lot of teeth, she thought out loud. She spent most of the day in her room trying to figure ways of getting more teeth. She didn't have any more that were ready to fall out, and although she tried pulling them out anyway, she couldn't do it. Gracie, get ready, we're going to visit Grandma today, her mother called from downstairs. After a short car ride, they arrived at Grandma's house. Grace hated Grandma's house. There was nothing to play with and it always smelled funny. She got bored and decided to search the house for loose change to add to her playhouse fund. She crept up the stairs and opened the door to her grandma's room. There on the table she saw a cup full of teeth. She quickly ran over and pulled them from the glass of water. Grace stuffed them in her pocket and quietly snuck back downstairs. Grace, go wash up, we're going to eat dinner now, her mother called out to her. She was sitting at the table waiting for dinner when her grandma came downstairs confused. I can't find my teeth. I must be getting senile, her grandma said with a laugh. Oh no, let me help you look, Grace's mom said as she stood up from the table. No, that's fine, dear. I'll find them later. I've got a spare set I can use, she replied. They finished dinner and said their goodbyes. Grace's mother asked Grace to put her shoes on. Are you doing okay? I know it's been hard since Ron left, grandma quietly asked Grace's mom. It's been tough, but I'm okay. I've been picking up extra hours at work, Grace's mum replied. She walked them down the driveway and waved goodbye as they pulled away. On the way home, Grace thought about how much money she would get for the teeth. Why does Grandma need extra teeth? Grace asked. They're not Grandma's real teeth. Sometimes, when people get older, their teeth fall out and they need to get new ones, she told her. So they're fake? Grace asked. Yes, dear, they're called dentures, her mother replied. Grace's hopes sank. She reached into her pocket and threw the dentures out of the car window. She went to bed that night disgruntled at her fruitless efforts. The next day, she again sat in her room trying to figure out new ways of getting teeth. That's when she saw them, sharp little pearly white opportunities. Her cat stretched and let out a long yawn. She quickly ran downstairs and took a small hammer from a drawer in the garage. Come here, princess. Grace said as she crept closer to the cat. Princess purred calmly and nudged her head against Grace's hand. Grace grabbed her by the neck and Princess hissed at her. She quickly swung the hammer and knocked out one of Princess's fangs. With a screech, the cat flailed and scurried away. 
Grace picked the tooth up and hurried upstairs to hide it. Her mother tucked her in, like normal, and after she turned off the lights and closed the door, Grace hid Princess's tooth under her pillow. She awoke in the morning and quickly checked under the pillow. It was still there. She must only want people teeth, Grace thought out loud. Defeated again, she sulked in her room. That's when the idea hit her. Her mother had sleeping pills in her bathroom. She had yelled at Grace for playing in the medicine cabinet and told her what they were and that she shouldn't play with them. Her mother had put a child lock on the cabinet since then, but it didn't take Grace long to figure out how to open it. She took the pills downstairs while her mother was out on the patio. She put them into the bottle of wine on top of the refrigerator. A few hours later, her mother called her for dinner. She hurried down and looked at her place at the table. She quietly ate her spaghetti and watched intently as her mother drank the wine. Soon enough, she was yawning. Grace was getting excited. This might actually work. After dinner, her mother groggily took Grace upstairs and tucked her in. Grace waited quietly in the dark until she could hear her mother snoring. She reached under her bed and pulled out the hammer. She tiptoed down the hall to her mother's room. With a long creak, she slowly opened the door. She was knocked out cold. She went over and slapped her mum's face to make sure she wasn't going to wake up. She didn't move. There was a small puddle of drool on the pillow. Grace raised the hammer high over her head and brought it down hard on her mother's face again and again until she had knocked out nearly all of her teeth. She collected them in her hand and turned to take them back to her room so she could place them under her pillow. She dropped one and with a click, it landed on the hardwood floor. As she bent down to pick it up, she saw a box under her mother's bed next to some wrapping paper. Becky's Beach Party Playhouse was emblazoned in big, bright letters. Little Gracie had succumbed to the power of greed. She didn't care how she obtained her goal, so long as she attained it. Perhaps someday she will realise that the price she paid was not worth it. But for now, it seems she bit off more than she could chew. And now we're going to talk about the film Doctor Sleep. Let me start by saying that I'm a huge Stephen King fan. I love the novels The Shining and Doctor Sleep. I'm also a big fan of Mike Flanagan and have been since I first saw his film Absentia many years ago. I've seen all of his films since then and his Netflix series The Haunting of Hill House is probably one of the best forms of horror entertainment in decades. I mean, let's face it, this is a man who took a subpar film like Ouija and then made the sequel into a way above average horror movie. Uh, Doctor Sleep isn't Mike Flanagan's first foray into the world of Stephen King. He'd already done the adaptation of... um, Gerald's Game and that was incredibly faithful to the novel I think that Flanagan's style is a very fitting match for Stephen King's world because Flanagan takes very big expansive ideas and the supernatural but frames them in very small personal stories and this is evident in all of his work from Absentia right up to Doctor Sleep The novel Doctor Sleep is, of course, a sequel to King's novel The Shining. It tells the story of what happened to the little boy Danny Torrance after he left the Overlook Hotel and how he battles his demons internally and externally. There is, of course, one massive problem. The movie Doctor Sleep has to act as a sequel to the movie The Shining. Stanley Kubrick's 1980 film is a classic of the genre there's no denying that and it's been studied and speculated on since its release there is even a documentary about it all the possible interpretations of that film the film is definitely a masterpiece and a masterclass 
in making film. What it isn't, though, is a faithful adaptation of Stephen King's novel. The story, and especially the ending, deviate drastically from the book, and King notoriously hated what Kubrick had done with the film. So when taking the reins on the movie Doctor Sleep, Flanagan had to make a decision. He either followed King's novel and alienated the mass who had seen the film and not read the book, or he had to make his film a sequel to Kubrick. He decided on the second option, which, from a cinematic and commercial point of view, was definitely the right idea. Even if it does mean that the film makes the same mistake that Kubrick's film made. Uh, But we'll talk more about that later. The prologue shows a young girl being drained of her life force and shine by a group of psychic vampires known as the True Knot. Now, this group is led by the enigmatic and beautiful Rose the Hat, who is played to absolute perfection in the film by Rebecca Ferguson. The film proper starts with young Danny, now living in Florida with his mother, both of them trying to come to terms with the things that happened to them. Wendy struggles to look at Danny as his eyes remind her so much of his father. Danny uses his shine to change the colour of his eyes from brown to blue, which is a nice touch uh, added to the film, I think mainly to excuse the fact that uh, Ewan McGregor has blue eyes. But, you know, it shows another element of Danny's shine abilities. During this prologue, Danny is haunted by the ghosts from the Overlook who've escaped and are hunting him down. With a little help from Dick Halloran, the cook from the first film, he learns how to trap these ghosts in lock boxes in inside his mind. We then skip forward to adult Danny, or Dan, as he is now known. With Dan, the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree because he's grown up to become an alcoholic, just like his father before him. A series of unfortunate events lead him to a small town where he takes a job in a hospice, helping those patients at the end to cross over peacefully and calmly, um, which earns him the nickname Dr. Sleep. He's psychically contacted by this young girl called Abra. Now, Abra has a shine that surpasses even Dan's. And she's seen what the true knot, the group of psychic vampires, are doing, killing kids with the shine. And she's, through doing this, become a target for them. Then ensues a psychic game of cat and mouse between Dan and Abra and the villainous Rose the Hat. After Dan and Abra manage to destroy the rest of the true knot, they face off against Rose in the place that Dan fears the most, the Overlook Hotel. This is the first point where the film majorly deviates from the book, as at the end of King's novel The Shining, the Overlook is destroyed when Jack Torrance deliberately avoids venting the boiler. It's this act on Jack's part that saves Danny and Wendy. In Kubrick's movie, though, Jack chases them into a hedge maze and freezes to death. So in the novel, there is no Overlook Hotel anymore because it was destroyed. Instead, the final conflict in Doctor Sleep takes place at a campsite, where, which is the former site of the Overlook Hotel. Danny and Abra are assisted in defeating Rose the Hat by the spirit of Jack Torrance, protecting his son and granddaughter, because in the novel we find out that Abra's mother is Dan's half-sister. She's a result of an affair that Jack had when he was drinking. The movie Doctor Sleep instead takes its inspiration from the original Shining novel, with Dan becoming possessed by the evil of the hotel and hunting Abra, only to save her by blowing the boiler and destroying the hotel and himself in the process. Dan dies, but comes back to Abra as a spirit at the end. I like the way the original ending of the first novel is now being finally put on film. 
in a way because Dan is basically doing what Jack did. He's deliberately blowing up the hotel to save someone he cares about. But I dislike the fact that it's making the same mistake that Kubrick did. Both source novels, The Shining and Doctor Sleep, offer some form of redemption for the character of Jack Torrance. They show that despite his character flaws, he loved his son enough to save him. Both films paint Jack as too weak and too twisted by the Overlook to do anything but follow its order. Stylistically, Doctor Sleep is a beautiful film. The early part showing young Danny in Florida and the end within the walls of the Overlook Hotel use Kubrick's very distinct style of uh, wide, slow-moving and panning shots to show the scale of places and the isolation of people within them. The rest of the film sits much more in Flanagan's own style, a much more intimate and human-centred style. The performances are excellent all round. It's nice to see Ewan McGregor back taking the lead in such a big movie. And I cannot think of another actress better than Rebecca Ferguson for the role of Rose the Hat. I mean, she literally looks like she just stepped off the pages of um, King's novel. I wish they'd kept the plot line of Abra being Dan's niece. The familial nature of The Shining is well established even in the first movie with Dick Halloran saying that he inherited The Shining from his grandmother. And there is the implication that Jack has some level of shine because he's able to see the things in the hotel that Danny can. So I think it would have added to the story of the film and given extra weight to the relationship between Dan and Abra. Also, I know they had to follow the film version of The Shining, but it would have been nice if they could have given Jack Torrance some redemption rather than showing him as some weakling who's still doing the Overlook's bidding, which is what they do with um, Henry Thomas taking the role of Jack Torrance in a scene in the film. But these points aside, I think this is a fantastic film and it's a worthy sequel to Kubrick's masterpiece and an excellent film in its own right. So if you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend it. And now for this week's horror movie news. Most of this information is going to be about release dates and casting things. Um, And obviously at the moment, a lot of that is up in the air with the coronavirus situation. But at the time of recording, this information is the latest we have. First up, the New Mutants film. Now this is the um, long-teased, long-trailered Marvel horror movie based somewhat in the X-Men universe. The film had been quiet for a long time. It had a lot of problems, a lot of reshoots, I believe. Um, But it laid quiet for quite some time. Then last week, it was announced as a digital pre-order on Amazon, looking like it wasn't going to get a cinematic release at all. But, according to The Hollywood Reporter, it seems the studio is still looking to release the film theatrically. Although there's no date as yet, it's quite exciting. We might actually get to see this on the big screen. Next up in the movie news, the writer-director Michael Doherty, who uh, wrote and directed last year's Godzilla King of the Monsters, has shared a video he's made called Everything I Need to Survive COVID-19, Learn from Sci-Fi and Horror Movies. And it's basically a um, compilation of scenes from films like Aliens, They Live, The Thing, all this sort of thing put together to uh, glory again as I will survive. But it's quite entertaining, so feel free to have a look at that on YouTube. Next up is the news that Shudder has acquired 
Joko Anwar's new film, Impetigor. The film debuted to good reviews at this year's Sundance Festival. Do you remember that? Back when we could go to film festivals and things? Seems like a long time ago now. Anwar describes the film as his love letter to horror movies. It draws inspiration from things like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and it's about a woman who discovers that her neighbours think she is cursed and plan to kill her. So, that sounds interesting. I'm looking forward to that one. Well, thank you very much for joining us for episode two of Everything Fear. If you've enjoyed the show, then please subscribe and tell your friends all about it. And all that remains is to let you know what we will have next week. We will have more short stories. We will have more horror news. We will have more spooky news. We'll have more true horror, more horror music. And an interview with Gary Smart, the writer and producer behind such documentaries as Leviathan, the story of Hellraiser and Hellbound, and You're So Cool Brewster, the story of Fright Night and Fright Night 2. So, until then, stay scared.